Okay. Hi, everyone. I would like to take today to talk more about something that we briefly covered in class um, when we were talking about pathogenic E. coli um, and also kind of how it pertains to research that I'm currently conducting the lab, and that is Shiga toxins. So I would like to go more in depth about the toxin itself, um, how it causes infection in host cells, and risk factors associated with it, um, both in human health and the fact that it is pre prevalent in the livestock industry. So first and foremost, what is a Shiga toxin? Um, as we discussed, uh, it is produced and originally came from the bacteria Shigella dysenteri, which I have pictured here on the right. And this toxin belongs to the AB family of protein toxins. And the AB refers to the fact that it is comprised of two distinct parts, um, an A fragment that is enzymatically active and a B fragment, which works to bind to host cell surface. So more depth about the A and B subunits. Um, here I have pictured on the right, the A fragment, um, which plays a role in protein inhibiting protein synthesis. And it accomplishes this by removing an adenine from the 28S RNA of the 60S ribo ribosomal subunit, which is located in the host cell endoplasmic reticulum. And this is connected to the B fragment by a disulfide bridge. And this B fragment consists of five identical subunits, which you can see in different colors here on the bottom portion. And all of these subunits work to bind together to glycolipid receptors at the host cell surface. So, Shiga toxin infection, how the toxin is actually able to cause an infection and ultimately host cell death. So as we know, the host organism is going to have to ingest a bacteria that is capable of producing a Shiga toxin. So once the host organism has ingested this type of bacteria, it's going to travel down the intestinal tract and reach an area where it's able to penetrate in the intestinal epithelium. So once it reaches the intestinal epithelium, this toxin is going to bind to the host cell surface through the glyco lipid receptor GB3. And what this does is this receptor is going to mediate endocytosis where the toxin is now taken in through the host cell and is able to travel undetected through an endosome all the way to the Golgi apparatus. Once it's at the Golgi apparatus, it goes through a process called retrograde transport, whereas the Golgi apparatus basically transports it to the endoplasmic reticulum. And in the endoplasmic reticulum, as I mentioned, the B subunit is going to, or, sorry, the A subunit is going to remove the adenine from the 60S ribosomal subunit. And this is going to ultimately block an EF1 dependent amino acyl tRNA binding, which then inhibits protein synthesis. And once protein synthesis is inhibited, of course, the host cell is ultimately going to die. And once this host cell lyses, it's going to release more Shiga toxin back into the intestinal tract and into the bloodstream where more infection of cells is going to occur. So risk factors that are associated with a Shiga toxin infection, the main one that in human health we need to be concerned about is hemolytic uremic syndrome, also known as HUS. And this is because this predominantly happens in young children. In fact, um, with children that are infected with Shiga toxin E. coli 157 each seven, uh, about 15% are going to develop this syndrome. Um, the syndrome can also develop in adults. However, factors that predispose someone to developing HUS um, are currently being investigated. We're not totally sure in research what causes someone to develop this. So how does HUS syndrome occur? Well, as I mentioned before, when the cell, the host cell lyses, it can release Shiga toxin into the bloodstream. And ultimately, this can cause an infection of capillary endothelial cells. And so when these cells are infected, it injures the endothelium, and it's going to cause an accumulation of thrombin and fibrin, which are types of co coagulation factors. And these factors cause clots, which normally 
when we get a cut on the outside of our body, clotting is great because it stops us from bleeding out. But when this is happening internally in our capillaries, it can cause some serious issue issues. So these clot these clots cause plasma plasminogen activator inhibitor one to rise. And what this inhibitor does is it stops the lysis of fi fibrin. So the fibrin is going to continue to accumulate in these capillaries. And as I have pictured up in this um, photo at the top, this is a capillary. The circle in the middle is a capillary. All of these dark spots are fibrin and thrombin clot accumulations. And so as you can see, that capillary is getting restricted by these clots. And so as I mentioned, it's going to continue to accumulate and exasperates the clot injury. And so what these clots do is when it happens in the kidneys, it's going to restrict that capillary and basically prevent the kidney from being able to properly filter toxins from the bloodstream. And this is going to cause renal failure where the kidneys shut down and you ultimately die. So Shiga toxin prevalence in the livestock industry, we know that um, O157H7 is the most well-known one. And I have here pictured what it looks like when you culture it. Um, this is macaque auger that's treated with antibiotics. And these dots are individual colonies of the O157H7. So this is what it looks like when you're growing it in lab. Um, we talk about different strains of O157H7, um, but it's also important to know that there are other stereotypes, which is other E. coli species that carry the same virul virulence gene, um, which is the Shiga toxin. Um, so some other common ones that we see are O45, O103, O121, and there are others. There's actually hundreds of stereo stereotypes, but in the industry, there's about 10 that are the predominant ones that we see. And as I mentioned before, um, E. coli is a bacteria that has been able to pick up and effectively use the Shiga toxin gene. And so why should we be concerned in the livestock industry? Well, obviously, as I mentioned, when a human is infected with Shiga toxin, it can have some serious consequences. And we know in the industry that ruminants are the major reservoir of Shiga toxin E. coli. Um, even though they themselves are not infected by it, they transmit it in the manure, it can get on their hide during the harvesting portion and therefore be transmitted into our food chain. Um, some examples of how um, people have been infected with STEC um, are through meats, um, predominantly hamburgers that were not cooked to a proper internal temperature, um, ready to eat sausages. Again, we have grounding of meat that um, can ground up the E. coli in it. Raw milk and unpasteurized apple cider and juices, which again, when we don't pasteurize something, there's always the potential for them to be contaminated with bacteria. Uh, lettuce and other vegetables, um, this is especially true if they are crops that have been treated with contaminated manure, um, contaminated water sources, and of course, contact with animals that are carrying STEC. And another really big component of this is the fact that the infectious dose is quite low. So um, in order to be infected with STC, you only have to be exposed to about less than 100 cells. And so I have myself pictured here on the right. Um, this is a study that we just did, which was working with O157H7. And I'm actually looking at different pro probiotic strains right now and their ability to inhibit E. coli growth. And we were kind of simulating this through an in vitro fermentation. Um, what would happen if we fed a probiotic to an animal that was infected with STC? Could we reduce the pathogen load? Because again, in industry, we are always looking at preventative measures, which is trying to reduce pathogen loads before we harvest animals, because then it reduces the risk of contamination in in-plant processing. So without, um, that's kind of the conclusion of everything that I had for y'all today. Um, thank you for listening again. Um, I hope that you found this interesting. And of course, I have my references slide, um, which has papers that I referenced uh, throughout the presentation. 
And if you want to read more about it, um, this is where they are. So thank you. Um.